the so I, yeah the starter uh yeah i think i'll be talking start. to you only uh, uh no few participants will join in i'm sure uh some some uh, will join in mm. uh, but we'll start on time because we'll not wait for them because uh, otherwise then we'll get delayed correct yeah i will just... uh so so a warm welcome to all the viewers uh, who are watching this program so this is a part of uh, continuing medical education for uh, the national newborn week which is celebrated all across india from 14 to 21st of november and also a part of uh, prematurity awareness day which was held on the 17th of november so as you know this is to make uh, make everyone aware of the burdens and challenges which uh, prematurity brings in uh, there are around 15 million premature babies are born, according to WHO, born every year in all across the globe. And so this year, the, the theme is that uh, the parents, parents embrace is a powerful therapy and the skin to skin contact starts from moment of birth. So that is a theme for prematurity. So now if you look at the logo, it's, uh, it has a purple color which indicates uh, sensitivity and exceptionality. And also, if you see, there are 10 pairs of socks and there are one pair, which is purple socks, to indicate that one out of 10 babies are born uh, premature. So uh, so every for every turn, 10 babies, one is premature. And uh, so this is a theme for the prematurity week. And then we also had uh, the, this National Newborn Week, uh, which the theme is that home care for newborns in urban areas. So they are more uh, focusing on uh, clean delivery practices, um, sepsis, a skin to skin contact of the babies, feeding, vaccination. And so basically prevention of infection in these newborns, because as you know, from birth till first 28 days of life, there is a, there is high chance of uh, mortality and morbidity. So this, uh, the first month is very critical and there are a lot of preventable causes which can prevent this mortality and morbidity. Uh, so today uh, I have uh, with us uh, Dr. Preeta Zoshi, who is a senior consultant at uh, Kokila Ben Ambani Hospital. So she has uh, done a fellowship in neonatology from Canada and she's practicing for now more than 20 years. She has several publications uh, in and uh, and chapters in uh, textbook of uh, neonatology, and uh, she also is a, a teacher for a lot of postgraduate students and uh, and fellowship students in neonatology, and she has experience in running a very critical NICU level three NICU at uh, Kokila Ben Ammani Hospital. So, with this introduction, I welcome Dr. Preeta Zoshi to a beginner session. So, Thank you so much, Ashish. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of uh, Maharashtra MMS activities. And this is a great endeavor that uh, you have taken up. So um, I think over the next 30 minutes, without much ado, we will cover um, uh, ventilation strategies and look at how we can make it very disease specific. So, so that we don't get uh, boggled by when we see a uh, child who's sick and figure out, trying and figuring out what best settings to put this child on. Um, uh, so that my slides are seen and I'm, yes, I'm, yes, and yes. I'm audible, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So um, what we're going to cover in this talk is a little bit about the essential pulmonary mechanics because I can't talk about ventilation without just quickly revising a little bit on the mechanics and the general strategy of ventilation for all babies, which will be the same for all the kids. Uh, and then we'll go on to certain disease specific uh, conditions where we have to modify these ventilator settings. So coming on to uh, basic mechanics, uh, there are a few terms that we need to be comfortable with for those people who are junior and uh, you know are listening to this talk that uh, we will always be talking throughout the talk about compliance, which is a very, very, very important concept, um, where we look at the distensible nature of the lungs and the chest wall. So it's very important to uh, remember that um, whatever pressure we deliver, what we are effectively doing by setting the pressures on our ventilator is trying to deliver a tidal volume. Uh, it is important to remember that neonates have a greater chest wall compliance. 
um, than older kids. And premature infants with RDS will have very stiff lungs. So they'll have poorly compliant lungs. So actually, newborns have a greater chest wall uh, compliance, but premature babies uh, will have um, stiffer lungs because of the lung disease that they're born with. Now, the second concept that we need to know is time constant. And um, within time constant, we need to uh, realize that it is a product of compliance and resistance. Okay, so generally the compliance is taken as 0 0.005 units multiply by around 20 to 40 is the normal resistance. So the normal time constant, if you make a product of these two numbers is around 0.15 seconds. Now within the normal time constant, which is the time required for an alveoli to completely expire its gases, uh, this is usually three times the normal time constant. So that is why Whenever we set the expiratory time and therefore the inspiratory time, the expiratory time should be at least 0.45, which is three times 0.15. Now, this is important to know. Uh, so never go below that when you, how much ever you increase I time, you do not decrease the E time below that. Uh, so in RDS, you have a low compliance. Therefore, uh, you will have a shorter time constant because when compliance is low, the product will become lower. In BPD and diseases like meconium aspiration, the resistance would be higher. When the resistance is higher, um, in that case, again, what will happen to the product is that you'll have a long time constant. So it's remember this, that um, BPD, meconium aspiration, where there's more airway involvement, the time constant will always be longer. Now coming to um, how it works in the baby with actual numbers. So in a term newborn, roughly the compliance is five. And in a premature baby, as you can see here, it's generally half of that. The resistance is almost the same in both the ages. So therefore in RDS, when you, uh, you would have a low compliance, a normal resistance. Why is this important? Because you will know what to set best when you know that the compliance is low, you know that you need pressures to open up the lung. Or if you're using volume targeted ventilation, you would need initially higher volumes to open up the lung. For meconium aspiration, the resistance is high. So in this condition, again, you will take care of how you adjust the time constant by increasing the expiratory time. In BPD, there is both, there is parenchymal disease and there is airway disease. So here the time constant would be increased because the resistance is much higher than the decrease in compliance. So how do you use all this? So whenever you have a short time constant, alveolus means what? The alveolus needs a short time for expiration. So here you can have deal with a shorter TE, that is the expiratory time. Whereas uh, in conditions like meconium aspiration, where you need longer time due to air trapping and airway involvement, um, you need a longer expiratory time to expire out your gases. Now, coming to general principles of ventilation, why, why do we ventilate a child? We ventilate a child either to oxygenate the child or to help in carbon dioxide elimination and sometimes for both of it. So for oxygenation, the really two factors that you have to remember, whether it is conventional ventilation or high frequency ventilation, the two things that help is the mean airway pressure and the inspired fraction of inspired oxygen. Now, um, in conventional ventilation, uh, the MAP depends on a lot of things, which is it is actually a product of PIP minus PEEP multiplied by uh, this equation, which uh, you can get anywhere. But the important thing to know is that it depends on TI, which is the inspiratory time, expiratory time, and also PIP and PEEP. So any of these you change and you can help with the oxygenation. So this graph shows that beautifully that there are five components uh, where when you change, you can help oxygenation. One, the first one here is increasing the flow rate and creating a more square waveform. Second is increasing PIP, which we generally do when we uh, are not getting good oxygenation, we increase the PIP to increase the tidal volumes that are delivered. Then reversing the IE ratio, Sometimes we have to do this, though normally that is not the first thing we would do, but sometimes we have to reverse the IE ratio. Then finally, giving a good peep so that the lung is kept open. And then, of course, the last thing is increasing the ventilatory rate. 
Now, uh, for CO2 elimination, there are two factors that help because what how CO2 in, uh, elimination happens is because of the minute ventilation of the alveoli. And that is a product of tidal volume multiplied by respiratory rate. So therefore, if you change tidal volume or you change respiratory rate, both of these will affect the CO2 el elimination. So factors that improve this is you can increase PIP, you can decrease PEEP, because when you decrease PEEP and increase PIP, you get a better tidal volume. You can increase the respiratory rate, and therefore you would be affecting the expiratory time. Uh, all of these will help with CO2 elimination. Now coming to few ventilatory settings, first thing is the PIP, that is the peak inspiratory pressure. This, the, the setting that you make depends on what you think the lung compliance is and that we will go over when we do the different diseases. But what is effective P, PIP is uh, whatever gives a gentle chest rise with each ventilatory breath. It is important to avoid extremes in tidal volume. Um, now, um, the other important setting is PEEP, which prevents alveolar collapse and increases FRC and therefore improves oxygenation. A PEEP of three to six centimeters of water is well tolerated by most babies. We usually don't go beyond it, but occasionally sometimes for some babies, we might need to go up to six, seven centimeters of water. But we have to remember at this point, there is a risk of over distending the lung or having air leaks. The last thing is the rates. So diseases, as I mentioned, with short uh, time constant, you would keep on higher rates. When you have longer time constant, you need to keep lower rates. Why we do this is so that we can expire better and therefore you keep a longer expiratory time. Usually on our ventilators, uh, a rate of up to 60 uh, per minute is well tolerated. Beyond 60, we might not be getting very effective inspiratory and expiratory time. So it might be time to think about another mode of ventilation. Um, now coming to FiO2, we know that um, FI, FiO2 is to be maintained to just keep the saturations in the range of 90 to 94 for most preterm babies. And that applies to term babies with uh, problems as well. And whenever your FiO2 comes down to less than 50%, it is time to start trying to wean the other harmful uh, settings that you have, which is pressures. The flow rate is usually kept. Most ventilators will already have their inherent flow rate set already. But in some ventilators like the Draeger, you have to set it. So you have to see that you keep it usually three to four times of the minute ventilation, which is in the range of eight to 10 liters per minute. Um, now quickly over, because many other ventilators will show these loops beautifully. But to see this as a visual to understand it, is that when you have RDS, this is what I mean by low compliance on a volume by pressure curve, you see that you need very high pressures to get any volume in this lung. Okay, so um, it's important to remember that when we are applying pressures, uh, when we apply pressure like this, as shown by this green line, uh, we are getting a tidal volume of around this number on the y-axis, but we can get that same number on the expiratory limb by keeping the lung open. Um, at the same much lower pressures. So this is the importance of PEEP or keeping the lung open, which is why we should never keep the PEEP less than five. Uh, ventilatory variables to adjust the ABG. Uh, for PCO2, most of you know, we have to adjust the rate. Usually we, uh, for uh, eliminating CO2, we would increase the rate. We can increase the PIP and we can adjust the IE ratio. We can increase expiratory time. And PEEP we can reduce. So reducing PEEP will actually help in eliminating CO2. For PO2, what you would do is increase PIP, increase PEEP if required to open the lung if under-recruited. Uh, of course, increase FiO2, but that should not be the first step. Uh, increase TI where that is required. Now for pH, which is low, it's usually because of one of these. So then you adjust accordingly. Now coming very quickly to our topic of discussion for the day uh, is um, whenever you get a diseased lung in a newborn, the first thing that you think about is you try to imagine before you get the x-ray, if you have the x-ray, you can look at the x-ray, but otherwise you imagine what the lungs would look like. So for a case of apnea of prematurity, typically you don't expect a, a lung issue, right? So you would get a lung like this, which looks perfectly fine. 
is slightly over distended also in this um, x-ray. So this kind of lung you would get in an apnea of prematurity. Why it's important to remember this? Because whenever you're dealing with a normal lung, you use the most minimal settings required to achieve your oxygenation and ventilation. So in this kind of lung, you have a compliance which is normal. You have a FRC which is normal. You have a time constant also which is normal. So everything is normal at this point. So you have to use very minimal settings to just see that the chest is rising and you are just delivering the rates to uh, help this baby breathe because this baby is having apnea. So you would start with CPAP. Many times that works. Uh, also non-invasive ventilation will work in these cases which you give you with some rate so that you are reminding the baby or stimulating the baby to breathe. If you end up putting this baby on the ventilator, you would start with minimal settings like 10 to 15 centimeters of water mm -hmm. with a peep of 4 to 5. And a short TI is also good, like around 0.4 would be standard to start with. And slow rates are also fine because even if you put a rate of 25 to 30, as long as your CO2s are maintained, that's good enough. You usually shouldn't need much oxygen once you have taken care of the delivering the rates. Target ABGs are just the normal ABGs. So I will not repeat this again and again in the subsequent slides, but the target ABG you expect in any baby is around 7.25 to 7.3 with a CO2 in the range of 40 to 45. And PO2s are good enough uh, in the range of 50 to 70. And usually we consider weaning once the caffeine is loaded and the baby started breathing or the other causes that have led to apnea have uh, been tackled then you can start weaning this baby and extubating the baby to a CPAP or a non-invasive mode. Now coming to asphyxia, again, you imagine what the lungs look like. So in asphyxia and HIE, as uh, all of us know, again, the lungs are usually normal. You don't expect the lungs to have an issue. Sometimes you have a wet looking lung uh, or a slightly hazy lung, but generally the lung would be normal. So it would be a lung looking like this, like this child uh, that we had recently. So in this, uh, again, what's the compliance, the FRC and the time constant, all of them are normal. So again, you would do the minimal settings, uh, not repeating it, but similar to apnea. You would set the minimal rates required. You would set minimal oxygen required. Here you have to be careful about not creating hyperoxia and therefore uh, causing new damage to the lung, a uh, new damage to the brain that is already going through a, a you know storm phase with the asphyxia and again you uh, accept normal gases here you have to be a little careful that you keep the po2 these babies tend to have some pulmonary hypertension due to what has happened at the time of birth um, they tend to have pulmonary hypertension so you would keep their po2 slightly on the higher range um, the in hmd again what does the lung look like uh, all of you know in an x-ray, you would get a ground glass appearance, which means what do you actually mean by ground glass is you have diffuse atelectasis because you don't have surfactant. So this would be, this is a severe HMD, but this would be how a typical HMD x-ray would look like uh, where we face challenges uh, with ventilation. So here, what's the issue? Um, I think by now, most of you can start guessing what is happening with compliance. Compliance is low. What's happening with the FRC that is also reduced and your time constant, as I mentioned, because these lungs are already at the electric, it does not take much time to expire. So they are short time constants. So in this situation, of course, the remedy is to give the deficient uh, product, which is surfactant. So first you would try and give surfactant in, the, in such a severe disease. You would try to give the natural surfactant as early as possible. If it's mild to moderate disease, you can do insure where you would have the baby on non-invasive ventilation and you could uh, put in the surfactant by different techniques even without intubation so you can use mist and lisa here give the surfactant and then put the child on uh, settings which i would just discuss again it's important to think of what are your main issues because you have atelectasis and therefore uneven perfusion you have hypoxemia and you also have hypoventilation, therefore CO2 retention. So these are the two things you have to look after. So in this kind of child, you would uh, set a PIP to achieve a tidal volume of around 5 to 6 ml per kilo. 
usually you can give around 15 to 20. Sometimes in the initial phase, you would need higher pressures. A moderate PEEP is good enough um, throughout usually. So starting with a PEEP of 6 and an eye time of around 0.4 again. Rates here, you use slightly higher rates like I mentioned. When we have short time constant, we use higher rates. Um, FIO2, you would keep slightly higher than you needed on CPAP and then uh, 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 adjust the FIO2 based on the SPO2. So this is typically what will happen to a loop. So you have a RDS loop lying low like this. Uh, I usually uh, tell my residents a tired loop which is lying down and then you give surfactant and it uh, stands up immediately. Now remember this can be very immediate. It can be within 15 to 20 minutes of surfactant. So therefore, when you are giving surfactant to a baby, you can go from an X-ray that looked like that to an X-ray like this very, very, very quickly. And therefore, also over distension and pneumothorax. So you have to be extremely careful uh, to watch the measured uh, minute ventilation and tidal volume. So this usually comes up on all the ventilators and keep the screen on the measured values so that you are watching this at the bedside. You do not give surfactant and go away and come back and see the baby after one hour. You have to sit at the bedside and keep decreasing the PIP and the FIO2 if required also the PEEP to safe levels uh, because this improvement can be very dramatic and very fast. The again, ABGs again the same, but whenever you have parenchymal disease, you allow the CO2s, you are okay with CO2s in the 50s also, as long as the pH is above 7.25. So you do not, you are not in a real hurry to reduce your um, uh, CO2 in a hurry or rather increase your PO2 also because it's a premature baby. So again, you are okay with PO2s of in the range of 60 to 70 also. Uh, as soon as the baby gets better, the volumes in, uh, get better, we should go back to a non-invasive mode. If required, even if it's a very baby is doing very well, you can even go to HFNC. Now coming to a little more complex disease, which not many of us like to ventilate um, if possible. Again, it's better to avoid ventilation because it becomes very hard to manage a BPD on a ventilator. Again, you imagine how your lungs might be looking like. It's usually a lung looking like this. You have a lot of pie changes, which is pulmonary interstitial emphysema. You would have lots of air trapping. You would have airway issues. You can hear wheeze. You can have signs of bronchospasm and high CO2s. So uh, here you're dealing with a very complex disease. There is pulmonary inflammatory response because due to immaturity, surfactant deficiency, you could have sepsis, which has made things worse, a uh, lot of oxygen toxicity, all of this leading to also uh, disrupted growth of both airway and of the lung itself and also pulmonary hypertension. So with as you chronically ventilate any child, remember, that you are also having an element of pulmonary hypertension. So because you have to handle so many things, actually it is a very challenging form of um, uh, challenging form of settings that we'll have to adjust for this baby. Here the lung compliance is reduced, the airway resistance is markedly increased and the time constant is increased. So our settings have to be very careful. I can't give you a blanket number, but you might, uh, it might be better to start uh, your PIP not very high, but at the same time, you have to just keep the lung open. Uh, PEEP might be required in the range of six centimeters of water and the other settings are generally the same. Here, the P SPO2 can be adjusted in the range of 88 and above um, because again, you're not aiming for an absolutely high SPO2 because the lung is deceased. So it is going to take time to recover. Target gases, CO2s here can be accepted above 55. So you generally in these babies, you have a compensated gas with a high bicarb and a high CO2. Now coming to pneumonia, again, like HMD, it behaves like HMD a lot. So again, the lungs look many times like a ground glass. Sometimes you have a low bar consolidation kind of picture with a pneumonia. Uh, again, here you need to think about what's happening at, inside the lung. There is debris inside the lung, there's bacteria. The lungs are uh, difficult to open up. So again, you have a compliance which is reduced. The resistance is, however, normal since there is no airway disease, but the FRC is reduced. And again, you need to have a short time constant uh, set when you do uh, when you set your ventilator. 
So PIP in the range of 15 to 20 centimeters, PEEP again 4 to 6. Uh, TI is good enough to start at 0.4. CI 0.4 is good enough for all, all, all diseases in the newborn. And rates also can be set at 40 for most parenchymal diseases, just to make it easy. Um, so you can always start with those settings and then adjust the setting based on the gases. Target ABGs, again, like I said, when there is parenchymal disease, you are okay with the CO2 of 50 also. Now coming to meconium aspiration, uh, Again, a complex disease because we have multiple disease processes going on. Here you would have a heterogeneous disease. You have air trapping. Sometimes you also have pneumothoraces. Um, because there is meconium in the airway, creating airway disease and ca causing a ball valve mechanism and causing air trapping. And you have meconium in the alveoli causing parenchymal disease. So uh, in this situation, there is then inflammation set up and then you have a whole lot of things happening, including pulmonary hypertension. So here, airway resistance is increased. Therefore, your time constant is increased. Airway resistance is significantly increased. Um, and the FRC is also uh, increased if there is air trapping. So in this situation, you would start with um, settings again of a PIP of around 15 to 20. Um, but PE should be kept uh, a little higher. So the main thing here, keep an expiratory time which is higher. Don't keep uh, very high rates. Start with low rates like 30 rather than 40, which I mentioned for other diseases. So these are the two things that uh, will help because you will prevent the um, CO2 accumulation in the alveoli and you're allowing it to eliminate by giving a longer expiratory time. Uh, here, because of the risk of P, uh, PPH, you keep the PO2 slightly higher in the range of 70 and above, uh, which I normally follow, and also keep the PCO2 more closer to 40 rather than the usual what we accept above 50. Because these kids can have pulmonary hypertension. Now, in pulmonary hy hypertension, we know that conventional ventilation may not be enough in many uh, babies, you might need other modes of ventilation, but you can manage a primary PPHN quite well um, even with conventional ventilation as long as your lungs are well recruited and you're taking care of hypoxia and acidosis. So here you will maintain a textbook gas like a pH in the 7.35 to 4.5 range, PO2 is in the 70 to 100 range and if oxygenation is extremely labile, you'd usually maintain a PO2 in the 100 range because you don't want fluctuations of PO2 leading to uh, pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Here, CO2 also is always better to maintain in the 35 to 40 range. It's like a magic number there uh, that you need to maintain and it depends, every baby is different. Other important things with PPHN is minimal handling, cluster care, calm and quiet environment. All of these will really help taking care of sedation when you're doing anything with the baby. Uh, it's extremely important. So um, I will just skip this uh, graph, but it just goes to say that the PVR, that is the pulmonary vascular resistance, is best when the uh, FRC is best. So you need to keep the lung optimally open so that the pulmonary hypertension improves. Um, here, you'll, uh, like I said, maintain a textbook gas because you want to avoid acidosis of any sort. You want to avoid hypoxemia as well. Now coming to pulmonary hemorrhage, again a parenchymal disease, so very similar to pneumonia, so I'll go over quickly. Again, the compliance is low, so here you would need to maintain good and high PEEP to prevent further bleeding, avoid suctioning, avoid handling the baby too much. Uh, the P PIP high also would help because you would just keep the bleeding at bay. Uh, target gas is similar to any parenchymal disease, here you accept any pH above uh, 7.25. Now coming to pneumothorax, these are specific conditions which I'm not talking in detail, but as you know, pneumothorax has to be drained and then you have to have very gentle ventilation for the lungs. Uh, that is very important. In CDH, you electively, if you know it's CDH and you have a high frequency machine, what I generally tend to do is start with high frequency. But if you're starting with conventional, start with very low uh, ventilatory settings, which are just enough to open your one-sided normal lung. 
So you have to be very careful because this one side of the lung also is hypoplastic. So extremely careful to use low pressure. So typical pressures to start with would be 14 to 16 PIP with a PEEP of around 5. Why are we talking so much about being gentle, gentle, gentle is to prevent ventilatory induced lung injury. Because we know that when we normally give a rate of even 30, we are hitting the lung at least 43,000 times in a day. So uh, if we can minimize that, it's better. So as soon as you can come off our conventional ventilator is always better because all these damages that are shown here are better avoided. Therefore, avoid high peak inspiratory pressures. Allow permissive hypoxemia and hypercarbia. And there are a few things that help, like avoid hypocapnia, uh, permissive hypercapnia in the range of 55 and above. Um, ventilatory strategies, again, to minimize rely from the oxygen point of view, is don't aim for um, too high oxygenation. So anything in the range of 88 to 95 is good enough. When you have very sick lungs, I even accept a SPO2 of more than 85%. We are very happy with that, whether it's meconium aspiration, whether it's severe HMD. Um, other methods to avoid ventilator-induced lung injury is taking care of good sedation. You don't want the child to be uh, having a synchrony on the ventilator, which will yeah. injure the lung. Proper fluid and electrolyte management. Um, good management of a PDA if that exists, because that will create a lot of issues in the lung by pulmonary edema, etc. Taking care of nutrition, which we generally don't uh, tend to forget to look into the details, but that should be looked at every day. Sometimes postnatal steroids, if and when required, with proper counseling of the parents. I think with that, I would just end uh, my talk here. I think I'm just on time. Yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, very well explained and making it so easy to understand. Uh, so I think you've covered uh, most of the topic on disease-specific ventilation. I had, uh, so we have Dr. Shilpa is here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dr. Shilpa, do you have any uh, comments and questions? No, no, no. Excellent deliberation, uh, Preetha, ma'am. I think uh, you covered all topics which are supposed to be there in one day ventilation workshop in just half an hour. Excellent deliberation and uh, uh, very nice. I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, ventilation is definitely important in uh, NIC when you manage a preterm and term babies. And as I rightly said, when we manage ventilation, we need to know the basics of the disease pathology and the basics of ventilation settings. Once we know that, then I think it's going to help in uh, uh, devising our lung protective ventilation strategy. And that's very important. So it's not just having a ventilator and ventilating baby. It is uh, all the science, what you're doing, to whom you're doing, and what the baby is, uh, the underlying disease pathology. Thank you so much for the excellent deliberation, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Shilpa. So I had just one question. Yeah. Uh, like what, uh, so sometimes these ventilators now have become like uh, complex. So newer, newer ventilators keep on coming. So uh, how do you, uh, like, how do you manage with the, trigger for ventilation like what do you keep changing or so normally the... uh yeah i mean we do that a lot more for older children but for the newborns you normally set it at around minus two uh to plus two range uh okay. based on whether you're weaning them or you're not um but generally other than that don't keep changing the triggers I don't do that. Uh, but if I have a chronically ventilated child, then if I want to train that baby um, and I want to start weaning the baby, so then in that situation, I initially support more by keeping a positive trigger and then um, slowly, slowly challenge the baby by bringing it to around minus one, minus two range. Okay, okay. Hmm. Yeah, because uh, there is sometimes auto-triggering happens and then you know, the baby gets overventilated. So, right. Yeah. So, those are due to, you know, when you have secretions in the circuit, um, which can then trigger and therefore you can have auto triggering, which is the commonest reason we get auto triggering. Yes. Uh, so, that can be taken care of. Again, the baby's own breathing, if it is, if baby's hyperventilating because of the disease process, then it is important to bring that breathing down by giving good sedation. 
Right, right. So uh, all of these things will prevent this asynchrony that we get, which becomes challenging when we are ventilating. Yeah. Uh, so you also mentioned about uh, sedation and um, analgesia. So do you ever use like paralysis for these babies or any condition where which you would like to use? So yeah. So uh, see, so most of the babies uh, because we intubate them with muscle relaxants. Right, always. Yeah. So they're they are initially muscle relaxed for half an hour or so. But after right. that, I, I normally just let them breathe because, uh, in fact, it helps us because we yeah. can adjust our rates based on how the baby is breathing. That is one. Um, second, uh, sometimes on high frequency with a very sick lung, like myconium aspiration, yeah. where I'm worried with you know any asynchrony, I might get a pneumothorax or air leak. There, I would use a uh, little stronger sedation and probably muscle relaxant for at least first 12 hours till I get some stability because here any fluctuation will cause PPHN also, pulmonary right. hypertensive crisis. So that would be a very specific condition where we would use. Okay. Uh, very sick baby, high settings. Yeah, you don't want the baby to be breathing against the ventilator in that situation. Okay, so... Yeah, thank, thank you so much. So th those are the questions from my side. I, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Right. Uh, so yes, uh, so from on behalf of Maharashtra State NNF, I really thank you for this uh, presentation and taking out your time uh, for this uh, NNF activity. And uh, so thank you so much. Yes. And uh, hope to see you soon in another uh, NNF yeah. session. So yeah. we'll tomorrow, tomorrow night also we have uh, one more session by Dr. Dattatre Kulkarni. So he'll be talking about uh, management of preterm nutrition. So all the viewers, uh, please join in at 8.30 tomorrow night for, for this session. So with this, uh, I'll end the session. And thank you. Thank you very much. And yes. Good night. Yeah, good night.